Good morning, everyone. It's Notaku, and this is your old pal, Guardian Enzo, with uh, my old pal, Setsuken. How are you doing this morning, Setsuken? Ready to pal around with you, my friend. And let me just say for the record that I did forget Daylight Savings Time and showed up an hour early for our meeting. So uh, we don't do the Daylight Savings thing in Japan. And uh, I think the reason that we don't do it is the same reason most of the world doesn't do it, which is because it's stupid. But anyway... Uh, we're here, and of course, uh, this is a big day for Notaku. It's the first episode of the second core, uh, not a split core either, and uh, a new and improved and ever evolving uh, Notaku podcast. Uh, this today is our first Notaku anime chat with our focus on the news, the anime news of the week. And uh, I also want to, of course, include a little icebreaker because we like to do those. And so here's my question for you, Setsuken. Since the theme of the day is news, and Lord knows there's a lot of news in the world as it it stands, even besides that, if you had to pick an anime character to break unwelcome news to you, who would you pick? Oh, uh, I think I'd probably pick uh, the... uh, What's his name? Pasha from the, the, the show... The the one where he's uh, he's basically a diplomat. Uh, you remember that show? No. What show uh, is that? Khalil Pasha or whatever it was. Oh um, uh, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, the the one about Turkey and uh, and, and yeah, a, it was on Amazon. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that one. So he's he's pretty good with words. So I'd probably choose him as my guy. Uh, give me your answer, and I'll look up what the, the okay. deal was. Yeah, yeah, and I love that show too. It made it upsets me now that I've forgotten. Um, but uh, I would say Fujinuma Sachiko from Erased, who was the mother character in uh, Boku Dake Ga e Inaimachi Erased, because she's such a uh, she's such a she's such a calm, under pressure, and and considerate and smart person that I suspect she would find the best possible way to break the news without breaking the recipient. So I think she would be my pick. Yeah, she'd also give you some tough love if you needed it too, right? She would, but she'd also give a, give you some, you know, a good, a good lunch too if you needed that. So uh, <laughs> she'd take care of you. She'd take care of you. Yep, and I looked it up. It's Mahmoud from Altair. Yeah. Was the anime, a record yeah. of battles. Yeah, so. Altair, record of battles. Shokoku no Altair, yes. A great show. Not as great as the manga, if I'm honest, but um, kind of a... A series in the family of Vinland Saga, I think it would be fair to say, but more in the vein of military, traditional military, something like a cross, I would say, between Vinland Saga, maybe a cross between Vinland Saga and uh, Twelve Kingdoms or something like that. Yeah, or um, Magi even. Magi? There's some magic mm, elements to it, I yeah, feel like. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you Magi. I'll give you Magi, okay. Uh, okay, so... Uh, but fortunately we don't have any bad news to break to you. We have good news to break to you, which is that Notaku is back. We're evolving. We're doing new things. But one of the things that isn't changing is we are going to share the feedback from our esteemed, I don't know why they're so esteemed, but we're going to try to calm them down. So our esteemed listeners, and, (laughs) uh, we have a bunch of feedback this week, as you can imagine, because last week's was really a, a feedback driven show. So we did get a lot of response to that. Uh, so, uh, since you can, I'll kind of go out down these one at a time and, uh, and you can chime in after each one, if you like, uh, if you yes, have anything let's to do add. That. Okay. So the first one was from the memorably named Bell and Beast Pawn All, uh, which is, uh, an interesting Beauty and the Beast reference there, uh, from our YouTube channel. And they said, um, basically you know, and this was a weird thing because uh, the comment disappeared, we're, and we're not sure why. <laughs> but uh, basically, this person said, I think something along the lines of, uh, you know, splitting up the format is fine, but doesn't want to lose anything. Is that more or less as you remember it? Yeah, I mean, I kind of wrote the notes for this one because uh, I responded to him and he was basically on the same page with some of the stuff that we talked about last week with doing a shorter anime news centric podcast which is what today is and then doing some of the other stuff like a monthly topic of the week and you know splitting up manga recommendations and some of the other stuff into its own stuff so he was on the same page with us 
I wonder if my comment, uh, which kind of told him that we had uh, covered a lot of this stuff in the episode, if he just wasn't all the way through because it was a long episode and then he deleted it because he felt, you know, that it was um, redundant. But whatever the case, we appreciated the comment and we appreciated it so much that we wanted to highlight it here because I'm sure there are people that did not go through the entire two and a half uh, episode uh, long podcast last week. No excuses. Listen to the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Next up, we have our old pal, Princess Usagi, uh, the rabbit princess from uh, our YouTube channel, although she left this comment on Lost in Anime. And uh, I have, by the way, just for the record, I'm getting some folks saying it's easier or they prefer to comment on LNA on my posts on this. And I just want to say that's fine. If you want to comment on LA or Anime Evo, that's perfectly fine too. We like our comments uh, anywhere, anywhere you get them. They do help us on YouTube, but we're happy to have them wherever you care to leave them. Uh, so Princess Usagi says, congrats on the full core. Her first note is she likes the insert music. Uh, she says it's like turning the chapter on the book. Uh, which I, I kind of feel that way too. I described it as like the wipes in, you know, in a, in, in a, in a visual, like an anime or TV show movie, which I think she does say the music was a little jarring, but she didn't think so until someone pointed it out. Uh, she likes the idea of changing it every core, which I think makes sense too. Uh, kind of what an anime does. Right. So I think, I think that would be good. Uh, she also says she finds fan service irritating. Uh, but she tries to look at it as an art, uh, like Western, uh, highly regarded Western classic paintings, which have nudity and things like that. So uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, but the problem, as she points out, is that for non-anime fans, it can the fan service part of it can be the only part of anime they ever they ever hear about in the mainstream news. So they think that all anime is like that. And I will say that I have, uh, I have experienced that syndrome where non-anime fans either think anime is all porn or it's all sci-fi and um you know there was a time when sci-fi was far more prominent in anime than it is now but that was never true and it's never been true about the porn thing either but sometimes like with this this shit that went on down in australia sometimes that is the stuff that that's muggles that's all they hear about it so uh, although that was about light novels more than anime but nevertheless you get my point so yeah i agree with you princess Asagi. i think that can be a problem um totally and she yeah you, you, let me just say the last part of this real quick she says um with the variety of anime and manga in existence there's an anime out there for everyone and, and i agree with her especially on the manga side uh even non-anime manga fans there's something out there that's tailor perfect for their interests probably in anime and certainly in manga so your thoughts on the princess's comments so the first part of it um I definitely see the feedback. I think the robotic sounding thing, which is what she was talking about, might be more so to do with the voice, which I edited to kind of sound robotic and metallic. And the whole theme was kind of very modern, trancey. So we'll use a different vibe for this next score. And if you're hearing this episode, you'll hear it. So give us uh, feedback on how, what do you think of it? Um, as for the fan service thing, I totally, totally agree me and one of my friends, the friend that I keep mentioning here and there, but uh, I spent a good deal of my college years with him and we watched anime and one of our other friends, she was, uh, she would not touch anime because of her preconceived notion that it was just, like you said, it was porn, it was all sexualized, it was all crass. And so we often would make a game out of it and joke whenever we saw a scene in an anime, how would she react if she saw just that scene out of context. So there's way too many of those scenes out of context that can just completely ruin the image of the medium as a whole. But, you know, that's just how it is. I'd say. And I think, yeah, and I think that raises an interesting point, which is, you know, when you're creating anime, and I think we've talked about, it, and I felt this more so than you, but I, I, I think that there are elements, instances where fan service is sort of, A, it, it's okay because it's, it's, tasteful and funny or b it's well incorporated into the plot like with our 15 it's not it's not really the province of creators in anime to worry about how non-anime fans take things is it so that doesn't only apply to fan service that is maybe an unfortunate side effect but i don't think anyone is at fault for that per se i don't think anime should be making uh decisions based on how the product is perceived by people who know nothing about it yeah that's fair 
Yeah, that's fair. And I would say to go into this topic more in depth, check out last week's episode. Exactly. Just because exactly. it was a monster of an episode. It was. So. It was. It was a big, what did you call it? A big, chunky, uh, big, chunky, big, man chunky hunk boy. Or something. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then again, Riv from uh, this time on LA uh, it says, I'm glad to hear about all your plans. I can well imagine the amount of effort it takes to produce something that sounds as smooth and polished as these do. Well, we certainly appreciate that, uh, especially our producer, Satsuken. Uh, kudos to you guys. Uh, he does say he likes to come in on LAA, which again is perfectly fine. Uh, he says he really enjoyed the discussion of fan service, gave him a lot to think about uh, from the perspective of someone who is female, which I think, you know, again, we 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 have a sizable percentage of our audience is female. Uh, so there is, again, a misconception among non-anime fans that the anime audience is overwhelmingly male, and it's not. And I'm glad that our podcast, uh, our Notaku channel, seems to have a pretty gender-balanced audience because I think that reflects that we're doing something right in the way we're inclusive in the, the types of things we talk about and the types of shows we talk about. Uh, but Riv says... Um, Fan service often starts at the level of character design, which I would agree with. Uh, and a good example of this, again, would be Fairy Tale with Lucy, although that's the character design from the manga Ka. And that's kind of a double edged sword for me because I love that character design, but there's no question it's a fan servicey character design. Um, she does say that usually these moments could be cut without any detrimental uh, effect on the plot, but they're a minor in- irritation for her. There are times when it crosses the line. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, I had a little conversation actually with her about this because she said uh, that one of the times was Seven Deadly Sins. And she says she mm-hmm. dropped Seven Deadly Sins uh, because of Meliodas' treatment of Elizabeth was too much like sexual harassment or seku hera, as they say in uh, Wase Ego, as they say in Japan, uh, to the point where she was disturbed by it. Now, this is an interesting one, and I want to get your feedback in this because my response to uh, to Riv was first of all, thank you for a great comment. Um, and second, having dropped Seven Deadly Sins uh, over this issue, what was your opinion of Fairy Tale and its approach to fan service? Uh, now you've watched both Fairy Tale and Nanatsu, yes? Yes. Okay. Now I dropped Nanatsu and Fairy Tale, but I watched Fairy Tale for much longer. I dro- I did not drop Nanatsu because of the fan service. And I have to say, maybe that's because I'm a guy and I didn't find something offensive that she did, and maybe I should have, but I just generally dropped it because I didn't find it that interesting. But now she said, I, she dropped Fairy Tale after a couple of episodes, but she didn't think the fan service issue was as much of an intrusive factor in Fairy Tale as it was in Nanatsu, whereas I found it to be roughly similar. What do you think? So I think they're slightly different, but they both are problematic in their fan service depiction. It depends on how far you get into each. So with Nanatsu, the way Meliodas just like kind of harasses Elizabeth in public, just grabbing her boobs all the time and all that stuff. Dude, even as a guy, that just that just made me uncomfortable. And it's really weird that it's played off as this joke. And I think it gets worse the further in you get. And Mm. I've seen the first two seasons, no, the first three seasons, and I still need to watch the latest one. But that was, uh, besides the storytelling kind of going all over the place and adapting the manga really in a very quick way, in a fast-paced way, the the fan service, I think, gets grating and it gets annoying and crass in a way that just feels immersion-breaking almost. Like, you wouldn't have a normal person just doing that. So that's... And and Meliodas is kind of like a little kid in some ways with the way he does it, so it's just Mm. very odd. Fairy Tale, on the other hand, and I think I remember, because I blogged the series week by week, there is a point in Season 2 where it becomes almost humiliating and rapey. Okay. Um, And that's the point where people just completely there's this one scene that i think half the fairy tale audience probably dropped it after that and i did not blame them for it mm. um i had a, a larger tolerance for it but i think you know the whole it, it wasn't like rape but it was definitely humiliation and female humiliation as part of this whole story arc and that was that was kind of the the reason that got the main characters and everybody fired up cuz they felt really angry at what happened to her. 
but that kind of stuff, I think that is what fairy tale. It's only, it's only done it once, but it's been so bad that a lot of people just wanted to like rinse their mouth with like alcohol or something. Okay. Well, I, th- that's the thing. If you tell me it was only, it only happened one time. And I think that must've happened after I dropped it. Oh yeah. Season uh, two. That, that, that's a mistake. I mean, that's a mistake, but I mean, sometimes, sometimes mistakes happen and then authors realize they've made a mistake and don't make the same mistake again. Uh, so maybe that happened with fairy tale. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I want to also mention with just because it came down to these two shows that the target audience for both of these series, more so even with Nanatsu, I would say, than Fairy Tale is middle school students. So, you know, in that early teen age bracket, mm. like like tweens and early teens, like twelve to fifteen, that's really that's really the butter zone for the demographic appeal of especially Nanatsu, but also Fairy Tale. So the kind of I think fairy tale skews a little older than Nanatsu, generally yeah, speaking. Yeah, but Nanatsu especially is 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 pretty much the meat and potatoes. There is boy, I must be hungry. Butters on meat and potatoes of uh, of that show is is middle school students. So that's a little concerning to me. Uh, that you know, the, and I remember Meliodas is the main character, right? He's he's like the main yes. dude. Yes, he is. That he is doing this, and it's treated as being perfectly fine and funny. I think that would be a case where. You know, if I'd stuck with the show long enough, I probably would have dropped it over that too, because that sounds really skeevy. Um, yeah, and Elizabeth doesn't mind, kind of, but she kind of is embarrassed by it. So okay. it's just, and at one point, she just, after a while, she just kind of gives in. So I think the people that defend that part of it say that because she's okay with it, it's fine. But even, mm. I don't know, it's just, yeah, it's a thing. I think there are enough reasons to not f- follow Nanatsu no Taize, um, and this is one of them. So, All right, there you go. Uh, okay, next up is our old pal Red, also from LIA and YouTube. And Red tells us this week that the favorite part of the, the podcast is the hard, it was a hard question, uh, and he said he chose topic of the week because it was given more time and discussions in depth as it should be. And, uh, you know, that seems to be the general broad consensus is that People loved all the all the main features, but that uh, the topic of the week, deep dive stuff, they really like that, and we like it too. So you know, message received, right? So thank you for that, Red. Uh, the Oricon rankings is he doesn't want to get rid of them. He says indifferent, but they're fine because they he can learn obscure stuff about popular series. Uh, not his favorite portion. Uh, glad to hear a Sopranos mention. Uh, how do you compare it to other TV shows regardless of genre? Well, we can talk about that at the end, I guess, when we get to the questions. Yeah. But one brief one is why does Sitsukin keep calling LA Lost in America? Uh, and I just want to answer that since it's my website. So the original, the original uh, that's a quick answer. The original name of the website was Lost in America, uh, LIA. Uh, it was originally not an anime only website. Anime was a portion of it. It was just my sort of a general personal blog. I was doing, you know, wine reviews and sports and all kinds of stuff. And Lost in America, if you don't know, is an absolutely wonderful film by Albert Brooks, which you should see if you haven't seen it already. And, uh, you know, I, I love I love that movie. And I just kind of like the idea that the, the concept of Lost in America, it, a lot of people feel that way. A lot of people, you know, so I thought that was great. So I chose that. That's why it was. That's why Setsukin calls it Lost in America. And that is still... In in my mind's eye, the official name of the website Lost in America, but the URL is lostinanime.com. So and since it's the same initials for most people, it's Lost in Anime, and that kind of makes more sense anyway because anime is ninety five percent of what I talk about. So that's the reason, Red. Just so you know. Uh, and um, the last thing, whatever changes or add-ons to the production committee decides. Thank you, production committee. I consider that, an- but thank you anyway. Uh, Red will gladly support it, and thanks for a great podcast. So there's Red. Any thoughts on Red's comments? Yeah, I think he was uh, really nice with a lot of the feedback that he gave, and it, it was very useful. And you mentioned the Lost in Anime thing. I'd just been following the website for so long, so it stick, stuck with me. And uh, yeah, the production committee thing, I think he meant it as a cheeky yes. kind of praise. I, I enjoyed that little thing. So Cheeky monkey. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, cool. Cool stuff. Thanks. And now we have our pal Nix, another uh, regular on LIA, who says, fans, uh, oh no, we already did that one. Uh, oh yes, fan service often starts with character design. Yes, another person who said that. Um, and sometimes it's enough to look at the poster of an upcoming show to form your expectations. 
Now, this is very interesting because we had two specific people say the same thing, that it's character design that's really the key to this. And there, I'm sure, is some truth to that. But it's interesting that two of our commenters independently came up with that point. It's kind of strange to me, Nick says, that people start watching a show with obviously sexy or sexualized character designs, and then they complain about too much fan service. On the other hand, I understand the character's behavior in a script can change to the point where it becomes unacceptable. Uh, so before I get to the rest of Nix's comment, I think that's worth taking right on its own merits. What do you think about this idea of uh, the, 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 you know, the promo material tells you whether something is going to be a fan service show, and if, and if you object to it after you don't take the warnings they give you, then it's your fault pretty much and not the fault of the creator. Yes, we talked about this in last week's episode a little bit by talking about shows that kind of advertise what they are uh, right on the cover, as it were. And I think that idea definitely holds true here. I think also if the fan service is too much for you because of something, whether it's the character designs or just the way fan service is handled, I think that's a completely reasonable reason to not want to watch something. And I respect a lot of people for that. That's never like a dumb reason for me. If somebody says the fan service is too much in this show, that's a fairly valid answer. Before we move on though, the Mm. one thing I will say, the amount of comments we've gotten on this and the amount of new ideas that have sprung from this, we need to do a fan service in anime part two or something at some point. Yeah, I agree. But I, you know, this is a, this is a magic topic for anime fans. It's also very, it's a hot button issue too. So in that sense, it's almost a perfect storm of a deep dive topic. Uh, but, the, you know, we've said this about multiple deep dives that, boy, we need to do another episode on this, which I think which I think is good. It, it tells us that we're talking about some interesting things. Uh, and uh, Nix also says, nice to hear about your plans regarding Notaku. Sounds interesting, though, de- though demanding. I think neither of us would brook any disagreement with that. It's absolutely mm-hmm. true. OK, and then Flare Knight on YouTube, who is also, of course, one of the one of the writers on Anime Evo, says fan service. Now, there is a topic. That's an understatement. There are times it can be a negative, there are times it can be a distraction, but there are ways to integrate it naturally and in clever ways so it isn't harming the show, uh, which is not a bad thing in the sense to throw some people a bone, and I I would say I agree with that. Whether it's a good or bad thing depends on the person, but I think it has a place. All I ask is that it doesn't hurt the show, Uh, and I, I think that pretty closely mirrors my general thematic point last week. It, it depends on the situation. But don't throw out the baby with the bad water, but the bathwater. It can be a harmful influence. It can be a distraction. But there are times, if it's handled the right way, it can be neutral, or or if it can be integral to the plot, or it can be funny. And in those instances, I think it can be a positive as long as it's done the right way. Yes, and this is, I think, the first instance of you and Flair Knight actually agreeing on something. Yes, so you we might must, be right. We must we must throw a party. Uh, okay, and that is our feedback. Uh, our feedback loop for this week but you know we've got one big 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 meaty big meaty guy what was it you were saying last week big meaty big meaty chunky boy you're never you're never gonna let me forget that are you okay so uh, you know we used to have uh chunky beef stew that's what we used to eat out of a can uh, in in the old days and that and dinty more so we're gonna have uh, uh we got more to come we hope you'll stay tuned for it uh and i think you probably know what our next big segment is going to be. The anime. So, dear listeners, something tells me a lot of you have been spending a lot of time watching the news over the past week. I know I have. Uh, but here's a different sort of news, and this is about anime, because this is an anime news broad- broadcast, and we love anime news. This is, again, the sun around which the Nutaku solar system revolves. And as always, Anime does not stop and wait for the world to pass by. There's always big news in the world of anime, and this week is no exception. But first, let us start, as is our want, with the Oricon rankings. Uh, You know we love to start with the Oricon rankings. So, uh, Setsuken, I will, I think as you did last week, I'll kind of just go through these, and you can make a little note if anything you want to talk about, and I'll just go through the whole block of them, and then at the end, if there's something you want to talk about, uh, go ahead and say it, okay? Kimitsu no Yaiba. Yes, you know that'll be a part. And before I start the main 
the main reviews. I just want to say that the uh, OP from uh, Tony Kaku Kawaii was ranked ranked number one this week in Japan. So that mm. is interesting. That 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 has done really well. So good for them. Uh, okay, so let's start with the weekly comic volume, which uh, this week shows us Kuroshitsuji at number one. Kuroshitsuji's new volume, the thirtieth volume of that series by Tobaso Yana, which sold over two hundred thousand copies. That's been a very consistent seller. Then a whole bunch of Kimatsu is the rest of the top 10. <laughs> uh, very shocking, I know. Uh, and then if we look at the bi comic work, which is the collection of all volumes, shockingly, King's Blade is number one. Uh, excuse me, King's Blade. Kai, uh, Devil's Blade or um, Kimatsu number one. Uh, Jujutsu Kaisen number two. And people, by the way, have been warning me that there is an episode of Jujutsu Kaisen coming up that they think they're calling quote unquote the their episode 19 which they think will elevate this series to uh to even higher levels we'll see curse it's jumps all the way up to number three with the uh with the release of their new volume promise neverland haiku ao ashi a great soccer manga which really really should get an anime and hasn't blue giant supreme a great Sign in anime about jazz music, which also should get an anime and hasn't. Then Kingdom, then Railgun, which uh, this is the manga version of Railgun, mind you. And finally, uh, Blue Giant Explorer, which is a sort of an extension of the Blue Giant Supreme manga. So, great week for Blue Giant, which is nice to see. I have no illusions that that will ever get an anime. Uh, sign in rarely do, but you never know. It's not impossible. Let's look at the Blu ray chart. Blu ray chart shows us the. Uh, one OK Rock Eye of the Storm Japan Tour. I don't know. Uh, oh, no, that's that's wrong one. That's not, sorry, wrong chart. The anime Blu-ray number one is, oh, it's your personal favorite. Movie version High School Fleet is number one. I know you're a big fan. What uh, is that? Yeah, uh, High School Fleet, it's uh, is, it's one of those uh, cute girls being battleship shows, oh, isn't it? Oh, okay. Yeah, Never yeah. Mind. Uh, Yahari volume two. Uh, Ray Zero number three, Railgun four, lots of light novel influence here. Then Paw Patrol, Demon King, uh, Demon, the Nahoka, Super HX Eros, and in the Snow Queen, uh, King's Blade one, excuse me, uh, uh, Kimetsu one, interestingly, Kimetsu volume one, number nine in the Blu ray rankings. What staying power? This was released in July of 2019, Volume 1 of uh, Kimetsu, and now it's back in the Blu-ray charts, and I suspect that's people who've seen the movie now are going out and buying the uh, buying the DVDs. Um, it's just amazing. It's absolutely just amazing uh, what this show does. Uh, and then last, let's look at the, the DVD charts, which look almost the same. Uh, Kagoya, uh, Kagoya wants to be confessed to is number five there. Mobile Suit Gundam Theatrical Version 4K Remaster Box. It comes, clocks in at number seven. And the rest of them are all carryovers from the from the other chart. So any thoughts on this week's rankings? Uh, yeah, it's pretty standard. I think there's some health in the manga space where we got some new people coming in. So Or old familiar faces coming right. in. So that was exciting to see. I mean, if you if you look at that collectively, uh, you know, which 10 would you would which 10 franchises are interesting? I think it's obvious that the manga one remains at the top of the health list. Yay. Um, so uh, let's talk about rumors. This is an important one. Uh, Chainsaw Man. This is a story from Crystal and Hodgkins at Anime News Network. Uh, the This year's 48th issue of Weekly Shonen Jump teased on Monday that Chainsaw Man is entering its final stage, starting with the mag magazine's next issue on November 9th. We briefly discussed this rumor a couple weeks ago that Chainsaw Man was is rumored to be ending, uh, which is really interesting because it has not been around that long. It's only been around since the end of 2018, and it's very popular and was rumored to have gotten an anime approved, although that 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 seems to have been a bit of a premature rumor, but it was thought to be inevitable. It's really interesting to see this series theoretically ending after only two years. Uh, Manga Taisho nominated, number four on the Anime Sugoi Awards last year. Really surprising. What do you think? I'm actually not surprised, and the reason for that is because it's such a weird concept, and even if you look at 
the art for it with all the like chainsaws coming out of this guy and his head is like really weird and all that stuff. I feel like this is something that despite how popular it is, is never going to make it into the mainstream. And that's why I also am not surprised that an anime probably was going to get off the ground and then kind of fumbled. And it's just that kind of thing. I'm actually surprised it's in Shonen Jump. I haven't read it, but just the art and the the vibe of it, it just doesn't seem like it fits, which is increasingly becoming the case with Shonen Jump stuff as they try to find their next gold mine. But yes, yeah, I'm actually not surprised with this. How much of it have you read, if any? Not too much. I think I read the first chapter or two. Okay. Um, I liked it. Do you think it will get an anime still when it's over? Do you think they'll just do like a one core anime adaptation or do you think the anime thing altogether won't happen? My fear is that it's going to be a CGI Netflix one core thing. And because that just seems like where it could actually live Mm. and how it could actually live with kind of the vibe and all that other stuff and how off kilter everything is. So we'll see. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, let's talk about next, uh, our, our headline story of the week. And even in a week with an American election, we have a headline story in anime. And I think our headline story this week is, uh, last week it was the Netflix slate for 2021. Now it's Noitamina. Noitamina, our old friend, uh, Fuji TV's Noitamina block, which has been around now, I think over 10 years and has always been kind of a bastion. It was originally supposed to be a bastion for Jose anime actually, but it's became then a sort of a bastion for any anime that was likely not to get funded by anybody else. And then sort of just became another anime block that could be anything you like, but they did announce a whole bunch of uh, stuff coming out in 2021. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of, I think Satsukin, uh, this, I'll, let me just talk a little briefly about the shows as, as a group. And then if the individual kind of treat it like the Oricons. You can, you can talk about the stuff you want to talk about. Is that work for you? Yeah, sounds good. And then we have another Noitamina related topic we want to talk about at the end of that, but let's save that for the end. Um, the first one is Osama Ranking, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, very interesting series actually, uh, which is going to be animated by our friends at Wit. Which it's always nice to know that Wit is going to be doing an anime, but we worry about Wit's uh, ability to get, to produce stuff when Vinland Saga remains in in limbo, but. Uh, Osama Ranking is, uh, is a title I always see when I go to the uh, to the bookshops. It's a very beautiful cover. It's very interesting. Never been translated into English officially or unofficially, so I've read none of it. But it's about a deaf prince uh, who uh, is in, lives in a kingdom where where all of the all of the different princes and princesses are going to be competing for the throne of this kingdom, and uh, it centers around this young deaf boy who's uh, weak and, and, but, and, and, you know, he can't wield a sword very well and, but he is the firstborn. So it's, it it looks very interesting to me about, and the fact that wit is doing it obviously spiked my interest in a very, very substantial way. Then we have Haydan Seai, uh, which is being animated by MAPPA. So you really kind of had the, uh, the, the yin and yang here, wit doing one, they only do what they feel they can uh, Mappa who does anything where the checks don't bounce. Uh, this is based on a manga. It's called Hey on say day now. Ida ten tachi. Uh, Ida ten is in the peaceful generation. I don't know anything about this manga. The covers are kind of cute. Uh, but it is by the Kobayashi dragon maid mangaka, which I know a lot of people really like. I only watched part of the anime and thought it was inoffensive, but not essentially all that interesting. But, so that is the same author. And I do think she has a very interesting art style. I'll give her that. Uh, then we have Bakuten, which is, uh, Bakuten is a rhythmic gymnastics anime. Uh, the thing that kind of struck me about Bakuten is that the character designs are by, uh, the character designs are by Robiko, who is the mangaka for the My Little Monster Tanari no Kaibutsukun, which is one of my favorite rom-com mangas. And uh, with other good people involved here, Yuki Shibata, a uh, very, very good animation director, and then the director of The Great Passage, which is, uh, which is a really, really strong anime that's very, very severely, severely underrated, in my opinion. Yes, I agree. Uh, so this looks 
like it could be interesting, although to be honest with you, I have absolutely no interest in rhythmic gymnastics. Same. Uh, but, and just for the record here, since it is a gymnast- rhythmic gymnastics anime, it should be pointed out, this is about uh, guys doing rhythmic gymnastics. Uh, so, so it's that's the, the main group. Um, and uh, what do you think about this particular list of shows from Noitamina, both sort of as a, as a block, what they say about Noitamina, and then uh, any thoughts on any of them individually? Yeah, I think the one that I'm the most excited about is the one by Studio Wit, which actually, if you go and look at the art, and we'll, we'll leave a link to the, the the news article in the description, but the art looks really, really awesome, and there's this like very fantasy, dark fantasy kind of vibe to it. So this yeah. one, it's based off a of web manga, which is also right. interesting. That's generally a red flag for me, but this looks like it's going to be very good. So that one's the most exciting one for me. As for the the thing as a whole, I'm kind of underwhelmed. The the cool thing about Noitamina A for me was always that there's just something really unique, something off the wall that you would get there. Like we we've gotten some series that really take a lot of creative risks and we yes. don't seem to be getting that as much. All of these series seem very safe which is kind of off-brand, it feels like, for me. So uh, even something like Fugo Keiji seems like it's more unsafe or more creative than some of this stuff. Uh, The Wit one probably looks the most original and creative. The Mappa one just looks like a crass fan service show to me. Yes, I Um, agree. So not super excited about that. But overall, I'm a bit disappointed no 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 Itamina a has given us some really good stuff and i guess this year they're underwhelming yeah i would generally agree with you i think that Noitamina, you know we've talked about it though they're not what they were and Noitamina has really become much more mainstream over the years and i think that's just uh, to survive honestly i think i think i think they had an idea of what they wanted to do and i think at some point they just realized they couldn't execute it and and financially keep going in the production committee market, and which is a shame because that's what they were really set up to circumvent, that they had to basically go mainstream in order to keep going. But I really think that's what's going to happen. I do think Osama Ranking is the most interesting of this group. As I say, the covers of the manga always always kind of drew my attention, but the wit, the wit production art here, it almost has a Tim Burton look to it, wouldn't you say? Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, as I said, the manga is is quite well regarded. I can only go by what the Japanese reviewers say about it since it's never been translated, but it is quite well regarded. And I think you know we have a tendency to put too little, too much stock in studios. I would say, but Wit as a rule, uh, and by the way, if you do want to follow this studio, Aegon Lewitt Anime News Network has an article about the uh, the premiere of uh, or or the, the the announcements with Os- Osama ranking. Wit does not generally tend to do garbage. Uh, when they take on a project, you, it's generally something that should be taken seriously. So, uh, because they don't do that much, they they what they do tends to be substantial. And if they can survive, and I think they can survive with that business model because they're part of a larger production IG umbrella, I think that's why they can survive doing that. I think as it's evolved over the last few years, Wit has sort of become the prestige wing of production IG. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. And I think they've also become the the blockbuster uh, place as well. They not only do prestige titles, but they're also commercial successes too. Yeah, they. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Vi- Vinland Saga, fairly successful. I think it's fair to say uh, something like uh, something like After the Rain. Probably not a big financial success for them, but uh, it was certainly a, a beautifully executed manga. Very good. Uh, and you did mention Noitamina A. We can talk a little bit about Noitamina A. Um, so, you know, looking at the list of what Noitamina has done over the years, Honey and Clover, uh, no, no Dame, Cantabile, uh, the Mononoke series, it's a long way from that to rhythmic gymnastics and fan service. And even The Promised Neverland, which, by the way, is a Noitamina show. And we'll talk about, let's jump into it, in fact. The Promised Neverland, there's another, uh, that's another issue. Um, the Promised Neverland has been announced um, as a 
2021 January show. Daryl Harding at Crunchyroll has a story on this. The Promised Neverland season two airs in January. The Promised Neverland is a Neutamina show. Uh, I, I, let me first of all say I like The Promised Neverland. I blogged The Promised Neverland. I will blog The Promised Neverland. I do think the first season's material is by far the best, but it's a good series. But we're talking about a blockbuster, popular, weekly Shonen Jump manga. Why does that have to be on Noitamina would be my question. Yeah, it definitely doesn't fit. And it's also co-financed by Crunchyroll, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, which makes it really surprising because this isn't a property that would be a hard sell. Uh, I felt the same way with Dr. Stone, so which isn't an annoying to me in a A show, but you know, you know, it's just the 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 placement of the Promised Neverland definitely feels off with Noi Tamina A. And yeah, it, this this is a show that would have been made anyway. Is my point? Yeah, I agree. So why was it? Why was it necessary to have a Noi Tamina connection, even in this day and age as it's evolved to be something different than it was? If a series was inevitably going to get a full adaptation anyway, why get Noi Tamina involved with it at all? Is is my question? And I really sort of still don't understand that. Um, but Hey, it is what it is. I mean, and, and, uh, you know, we can always hope that Noitamina will occasionally give us something really stand out and they still do, but you know, after the rain, in fact, was a Noitamina show. So I mean, full credit to them for that. And I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, I think, uh, I think uh, the great passage was Noitamina as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if it wasn't, it should have been anyway. Yeah, it fits. It fits like a glove. Yeah. Like a glove. So Anyway, that that's Noitamina. So Netflix and Noitamina in the last two weeks with big dumps of new shows for 2021. A few gems in there, but I think fair to say neither one of us were blown away by by the full by the full body of work that's that's on that's on tap from those two sources. Surprisingly so. Yeah. Less surprisingly, maybe for me. But uh okay, let's talk about some other new series announcements here. We have Cestivus. I don't have no idea how you pronounce this, but I'm gonna say Cestus. Sounds like an STD. Yeah, Cestus. Uh, you too can get Cestus. Okay. Uh, the Roman fighter uh, punches its way to TV. So this is a Roman fighting manga, uh, which will be part of the uh, Plus Ultra block, which I've always desperately wanted My Hero Academia to wind up on the Plus Ultra block. I think it's criminal that it never did. But um, in any event, this is coming up. Uh, this is uh, Cestus, the Roman fighter, going to be on TV in April. Uh, any thoughts on this one? Was boxing a thing in the Roman Empire? It doesn't seem like it was, but... I, I would have thought gladiatoring, maybe, with swords. Yeah, this is why this is so weird. It even has that Hajime no Ippo Ashida no yeah. Jo vibe. So I'm very confused. That's one it of is... the reasons I put it. Yeah, I have no idea. It, it is based on a manga, uh, which premiered in 1997. Uh, so I... You know, it. The, I think this is one of those shows where uh, it's so odd that I might just check it out just because of how odd it is. You know what I'm saying? It's like such a weird concept, boxing, literally boxing in Roman times. It, yep. it also should be pointed out it is going to be a uh, – the boxing scenes will be uh, done in CGI. So be prepared for that. Only the boxing scenes apparently. But um, anyway, so that's – Cestus, the Roman fighter. Then we have uh, Code Geass. Uh, do I pronounce that correctly, Code Geass? Uh, before you move on, I want to yes. go back to the other story. There is also going to be Yoshihiro Kamegai, a professional boxer, is going to consult on the series for the boxing scene. Oh, so okay. they're they're going all in. And did you ever watch that show, Levius, on Netflix? I did not. It was steampunk boxing. It was kind of like uh, the show that everybody liked that I thought was okay. The other one, Megalobox. It was like yeah. Megalobox, but it was more shonen-y. Mm. This reeks like it's Levius again. It's got that CGI vibe to it. It doesn't look super special, but then there's this celebrity tie into this, which just this whole thing is really weird, I, I want to say. Well, yeah, I think it is relatively common for anime to get a sports figure to be a, a consultant. I remember Ginga E. Kickoff had a couple of players from the Japanese national soccer team mm. consult on that show. So 
you know, I don't think that's super duper uncommon. I think it's kind of viewed as a prestige thing to have uh, a, a it's how serious oh, we're taking this so seriously. And B, they, it's a little celebrity tie-in, which never hurts. But uh, yeah, it is an odd one. I did not see Levius. I think I am one of those people you talk about who like Megalobox more than you did. Uh, as I ranked at my number one series of the year that year, although that was until 2020, the weakest anime year, I think, since I've been covering this, uh, the medium. But nevertheless, I, I thought it was a really good show. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, but if we, yeah, let's talk about Code Geass' director. This is from Daryl Harding at uh, Crunchyroll. Code Geass director's next TV anime, Back Arrow, uh, premiering January 20, uh, January 2021. Uh, Gore Taniguchi, who is a... Um, who is a, you know, yes, he's the Code Geass director, but he's done a lot of other stuff as well. Uh, a pretty big name in anime. This is a mecha series. Uh, it looks like, it looks a lot like Macross to me. Uh, the, the, the mecha designer here is Tenjin Hidetaka, who is best known for Macross, I think. That's kind of the overall look to me more than any of the other main mecha franchises. Uh, mecha anime, uh, you know, those are kind of um, kind of a hit and miss for me. I'm not a mecha otaku by any stretch of the imagination, although, you know, I love Neon, G Neon Genesis Evangelion or Eureka 7. There are some mecha series I love. Uh, there are some that I don't love nearly as much. So, you know, Goro Taniguchi is a very, is a very, very, very established, prominent director in anime. So certainly there's enough here. It's an original it's an original mecha series. We don't get as much sci-fi as we used to get. I'm very interested to see what this will be. It's going to air for two cores as well, which I think is a plus. Uh, but it's not something I come in with huge expectations for. More hopes than expectations, I would say. Yeah, I, I actually don't think this looks very good. It looks very cheap and Saturday morning cartoonish with the designs and everything. It It... And Goro Taniguchi, I love the man. Code Geass is one of my favorite series of all time. But he has had more misses than hits recently. I don't know if you saw the... What was the Netflix series that were with the manga uh, about the survivors in the apocalypse or whatever? Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know the one you're talking about. That was directed by him, I believe, and it was not very good. Uh, it was very rushed in terms of an adaptation but I might be misremembering. He's done some other stuff. I, I'm worried for the man. He, the last good thing he did was that Code Geass movie uh, that he went back to, and it doesn't seem like he's done anything super impressive since. So maybe this is a return to form. I'll definitely check it out. But first impressions don't look great to me with the character designs and the mecha designs and the very colorful, childish feeling to it all yeah I, I i don't i don't disagree with any of that it's just we don't we get relatively few uh the other thing that we should point out about this series by the way which i i i, I apologize for not hitting this straight up but nakashima kazuki is writing it and that should be a, a name that's very very familiar to anime fans because he's the writer of uh, among other things two great 2007 series, the one everybody knows about, Tenken, Tapo, Gurren Lagann, and one nobody knows about, Oedo Rocket, uh, He's uh, which is basically based on a play he wrote. He was He's originally a playwright and has really found his fortune writing anime. He was sort of, has become, um, he's sort of become the, the, the muse for uh, the main trigger director of, uh, Imaishi Hiroyuki, who came over from Gainax, he's worked with him on Gren Lagen and Kill the Kill and lots of other things. So Nakashima is the writer here, which again, I'm kind of, my feeling on Nakashima is your feeling on, on Taniguchi. I'm not hugely impressed with what he's done lately. And so my, my expectations are a little bit muted just because of that fact. But I will also say that uh, Nakashima is capable of writing some great stuff. So his involvement here, even if I don't like most of what he's done in the last ever really in the Trigger era, 
I think my favorite uh, Nakashima series at Trigger would probably be Brand New Animal, which is not that great, but it's probably my favorite Nakashima series at Trigger. Even if I'm not a huge fan of what he's done since the Trigger era began, I still think his involvement elevates this above the kind of probable whiff that it would be without him. Yeah. Because as we've discussed before, with the original series, the writer is often more important than the director. That is true, but I do think the thing that worries me about this is that these guys are so tonally dissonant from each other. The mashup could either mm. create something really interesting or more likely there's going to be this weird mishmash of two very disparate people and mm. visionaries. So we'll see how it pans out. I'm I'm not excited about it, though. Yeah, I mean, that's true. When you get when you get writers and directors who have wildly different styles tonally, you can either get something really, really wildly good or you can get something that's just a dumpster fire. Less often is it something that's just kind of in between that. So that dissonance, yes, increases the it, it higher ceiling, lower floor would be what I would say. Mm. Based on based on that, as to use a sports sports terminology, when we talk about prospects, you know, seventeen year olds who are about to be drafted in basketball or baseball, we say, "How high is the ceiling? How low is the floor?" I think when you have this kind of distance between the writer and the director, higher ceiling, lower floor. Um, okay, and that is our uh, new series teasy time for the week. But we never stop teasy teasy because we have lots of miscellaneous news, and it can't be a news report on Notaku without a mention of Kimetsu no Yaiba, can it? Uh, so if you look at the, uh, Japan times, we have a story here about, uh, Demon Slayer breaking Japan's box office record, 10 billion yen in 10 days. Uh, incredible. No more really to add from that, except just to say Kimetsu, Kimetsu, Kimetsu. It continues to be bonkers and nuts. <laughs> Anything to add? It's like Goran Lagan. It's like Gurren Lagan. It'll keep evolving, and pretty so- soon it'll become like its own mini universe or something like that. Gurren Lagan could only hope to generate as much cash as Kimetsu has generated. I was at Don Quixote actually last night, uh, just picking up some some miscellaneous stuff cheap, which is why we go to Don Quixote. They now have a Kimetsu no Yaiba wall at my local. Oh Don wow! Quixote. Even them. Yeah, oh, yeah, and they've always had some anime merch, but uh, Kimetsu, they have a whole Kimetsu wall with masks. And by the way, a big new item I'm seeing is the uh, Tanjiro. You know, Tanjiro has that green and white kind of checkerboard pattern yukata uh, or, or kimono he wears, whatever you would call it. Uh, those masks are now super popular in Japan uh, with, the, with, the, with Tanjiro pattern masks for COVID-19. Mm. Extremely popular. So there you go. Um, let's talk about a few miscellaneous stories. First of all, Horimiya, which I'm more interested than you, I think, because I've read the manga a lot and I don't think you have, but that's my top pick probably for January. I'm excited for it. Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, that uh, Nothing huge there, but new preview and cast announcements. If you look at uh, my anime list, Kingsman 117 has a nice story in this. There is a new preview, which is which is interesting mostly to me because it reflects that the Shinsekai Yori director who's working on this series, his style is very much intact. It's not, it doesn't, you would be hard to imagine a rom-com with a Shinsekai Yori look to it, but there is a little bit of that going on here, which is fascinating. Ishihama does not seem to have uh, tempered his style too much. Um, the new cast, nothing hugely exciting here to me. Nobuhiko Okamoto is uh, voicing uh, Sengoku, who is one of the friends uh, this is your, kind of your classic rom-com series. You have the, the male lead, the female lead, the satellite friend group, and the sibling. So those are basically the the, the main cast of characters with Horimiya. Uh, and we have not had the sibling cast yet, and he's actually a very important character here, so I'm interested to see who they get for that. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I'm just excited about this series. The more I see here, the more, uh, in, this, in, in probably a much bigger way than Tony Kaku Kawaii, um, this one looks really interesting. So, oh yeah, Horimiya is. I like Tony Kaku Kawaii. It's incredibly sweet. If we were doing a what we're watching segment, I probably would have picked that to to talk about this week, just because of how incredibly cute the last episode was. Hmm. But um, yeah, as someone who's read both manga, Horimiya for sure is a better manga than Tony Kaku Kawaii. Um, it's it's one of the best rom coms I would say of the last decade, probably. Um, hmm. I'm excited. Uh, Anime Japan goes live and online combo. I think this is a pretty important story. 
Crystal and Hodgkins over at ANN, ANN has a report on this. So basically the plan now, and of course everything in the COVID era is subject to change, but the plan now is for Anime Japan 2021 to be held as scheduled next March, 27th through the 30th. And they're going to combine an in-person event and an online event. So this will be interesting to see how this works. The stage events will be streamed and they will show the exhibition booths. And of course, as they always do it at uh, Anime Japan, they'll have a work you want animated ranking poll, which I'm not convinced anyone ever actually looks at, but it's an, at least they ask. And so this time around, the, uh, the, the public days will be the 27th and the 28th of March and the industry days, the 29th and 30th. They always have split this event up. So what do you think about this idea of, A, is that too soon, even in Japan, which is doing relatively okay, Knockwood, with COVID compared to most places? Is that too soon for any portion of this to be live? And what do you think about the combination of a live online anime convention? I think they have to kind of try and see where the line is, because at some point we want to start moving towards normal. In the United States, we just had a huge spike. So not to bring too much reality into this, but I think that does complicate things when there are parts of the world that are so far behind. And I think England also has another lockdown Mm. coming. So with that, I I feel like a good portion of 2021 will still have this combination stuff going. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. I I can't disagree with any of that. Uh, I, I agree with you at some point. We have to at least make the effort mm. and and see if it's possible. So I, I actually support them trying to do this live. I think at, if this were the United States or the UK, I would say, no, that's too soon. You can't realistically plan to do an event. Can you look at what's going on with sports. You know, sports is still going in, uh, is back and still going on in the States, but there are no fans. There were a few, they let a few fans in for the World Series games, but basically no fans. And I think it's going to be no fans for the foreseeable future. So if, if, if you, but you can't do an anime convention live with no fans, there would be no point. Uh, so I, I, it's, you know, I'll, I'll be interested to see how this works out. I've, I've gone to anime Japan multiple times when I lived in the Tokyo area. It's, 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 it's the biggest, you know, industry event in the anime industry. I mean, Comic Head is the biggest event, but the, the next big question for me really is what, when will Comic Head decide to bite the bullet and try to open up to the public again? This is, this is because Comic Head is the, is the 900 pound gorilla in the anime event world. It is the biggest by far. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, when they choose to do it. Uh, another new story, not a happy one. Uh, Banjo Ginga has COVID-19. This was announced on November 5th. There have been multiple uh, voice actors have been announced as uh, coronavirus positive, but I wanted to talk about Ginga-san because he is in his 70s and as such in a high-risk group for this. So he's, he's uh, you know, he's a very important actor. He was the voice of Nanashi in Gegege no Kitaro recently, which is a great, great, great performance in a villain role. He also took over the role of um, Chairman Natero in uh in hunter x hunter for the last year or so of that broadcast so Mm. uh i'm a big banjo ginga fan i also want to say if you want to come up with a cool japanese name i think you'd hard to do better than banjo ginga i don't know if uh that is his real name or not but it is an incredibly cool name uh he's also ginen zabi in the mobile suit gundam franchise i mean this is a guy who's been a great anime a great seiyu uh, and other things too, voice actor, but even non-anime stuff for a long time. So all we can all we can say is, Gingasan, you know, we're with you. Please, please, please pull through this because anime fans love your work. Agreed. Yeah. So, and a reminder because people tend to think, oh, it's Japan, everything's going fine there. Hey, you know, there's, it's, it's there. We still have our issues here too. Uh, they're not going away. One more announcement: Ken- Kenji Kamiyama. This seems to be a theme here, Satsuken. Uh, did some incredible work. Uh, obviously, the director and writer of Say Rei No Morabito, my favorite anime of all time. Uh, Ghost in the Shell stuff back in the day. Not someone whose work in the last few years has held much appeal for me. But again, the capability of doing something like Say Rei No Morabito, anything Kenji Kamiyama does, I have to pay attention. Doing a new movie film for Wow Wow in 2022. It's going to be a socially conscious youth crime adventure story. 
So that's all we know about that. But I did want to mention it because, again, it's coming out of Kenji. This is be coming out in 2022 for the 30th anniversary of Wow Wow. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I just want to say Kamiyama-san has done a ton of stuff. Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, Eating of the East, Moribito. Mm. So, and the Ultraman series as well, yes, which yes. I really loved on Netflix. So his track record, he has more... Uh, uh, home runs than he has strikeouts so I definitely pay attention to him a lot more and I'm sure this new series will make me go wow wow movie by the way but yes wow wow bow wow, wow, wow. it'll make you go bow wow no just wow wow wow, wow. oh wow wow okay okay all right, one more story. Uh, X Arm Anime uh, is uh, just wanted to mention this I wasn't going to mention this but the rain of social media scorn that has rained down on the premiere of X arm or in the, the preview for X arm is huge. I did want to mention it. This is based on a game. Is it not X arm? No idea. Oh, it's not. Okay. I, I wasn't sure. It's a manga. I think. Yes, it is a manga. Yeah. Oh, is it a manga? So two things I want to point out. Crunchyroll is the main funder of this. It's basically a Crunchyroll produced anime. And the studio hired a non-anime director to direct it. Um, they li- They hired a live-action director to direct it. And I think there was an idea. It is a manga, you're right. And I think there was an idea that this was going to be something that would be appealing to Western audiences. Uh, have you seen the trailer? I have not. What, what, what is so bad about this? It's horrifically bad. It's, oh, the uh, animation? It, yeah, it's horrifically bad. Mm. Did you see the new Ghost in the Shell CGI? You saw any of that? Uh, briefly, it looked very bad. So that is to this as B stars is to the berserk CGI that, so oh. that's, it's bad. It's, it's really, really, really bad. Um, so I don't know anything about this manga. Uh, I, a really, really horrifically bad CGI anime is not news in and of itself, I suppose, although the the social media reaction to this trailer is amusing enough that I encourage people to check it out. Um, is, is, is Crunchyroll trying to not get bought out by Sony? Is this their, their Hail Mary pass to stay independent or something? Uh, yeah, I, this is why I wanted to mention this story. Exactly that reason, because it is a, it is Crunchyroll's, is this there's their first right that they're the main financer? Yes, they've been involved in production committees, but this is really the first where it's their thing. And they're the whole idea of this was oh, we're going to make an anime that doesn't look like anime, and you know, and it's going to appeal more to Western audiences. Well, they made an anime that doesn't look like anime, it looks like you know what happens after you have uh, you know, a bad piece of meat the next day, you know, that's what it looks like. Um, so it's very sad. Uh, in a, in an era when people like Orange and Production IG and such are doing such incredible things with CG that we still get CG that looks like this. Uh, so even though you'll hate me later, listeners, dear listeners, I love you. Watch the trailer. Maybe if you go into it with the right attitude, you can get a laugh out of it. I can almost guarantee this will be the only part of the XR anime you will be watching. Um, because after you see the trailer, I'll be shocked if you decide to pick up the series. This will, this will not make you go bow wow, huh? No, this will this may make you go bow wow. Actually, it certainly won't make you go wow wow. And there is one other thing I want to mention here because you you mentioned it uh, really really quickly. Uh, is that uh, Tanaka from IQ? Tanaka from IQ uh, is trending on Twitter this week for the first time. So there you go. Why did you want to mention this? This, this is this is this is your baby. <laughs> it's just funny. Yeah, it's it is funny. It, we talked about him, right? It's like it's like oh that guy. And we both kind of said that guy. And I said, oh, do you the mean Tanaka? Guy. Yeah, the bald guy. So Tanaka finally trending on Twitter. There you go. So congratulations, Tanaka-san. You got your random romance out, your random romance arc, and you trended on Twitter. And that, dear listeners, is the Notaku News broadcast for this week with no mention of elections. There you go. All right, dear listeners, it's time for listener questions where you take the you take the stick and fly the plane although uh, and land the plane who knows so uh, we have a couple of questions this week the first one is from red uh who is one of my patreons and also an lia supporter 
uh, who says, would you rather be more surprised and more disappointed? This is one we briefly teased this last week, but just didn't, didn't get to it. So Red, thank you for your patience. Would you rather be more surprised and more disappointed by a bad ending or less surprised and less disappointed? So the theory being the premise of the question is that it's a bad ending, uh, it disappointing ending. And would you rather know about it so you're not as disappointed or would you rather still be unspoiled going cold turkey and have the ending disappoint you? So I'm going to let you answer this first. What do you think, Setsuken? Depends on how invested I am in the series. If it's like fairy tale, I knew because manga readers had been saying it for a while that it was not going to end well, but I didn't want to get spoiled for that. Something like Game of Thrones, which I know isn't an anime, but it it's still a TV show. That uh, I honestly would have appreciated the the dumpster fire warning a little bit ahead of time even though i was watching it as it was airing but i think that would have lessened the blow a little bit maybe not by a lot but still yeah i um i would rather be surprised and disappointed uh just to, to give my sort of broad answer to red's question i would still whatever it is i would still rather just deal with it and move on you know because it's, it's, it. I would still rather go in and I want my reaction to the ending to be as organic and honest as possible. So that can only happen, even if it's a disappointing ending, it can only happen if I go in unspoiled. So I guess I'd rather, you know, take the medicine and just deal with that disappointment uh, rather than go through the whole process of being invested in the series and then uh, have that part of it be be kind of taken away from me even if i'm disappointed i still want to have the right to have that experience honestly quick question though yes quick question though if it's something like shokugeki no soma or a series that you dropped you liked it fairly well wouldn't you more like to just know how it ended or would you just not care at all at that point uh i wouldn't care um honestly i wouldn't care that much i don't care how shokugeki and if i cared enough to stick around and keep watching it uh, I think I'd still probably say I'd rather be surprised, but with something like okay. Shokugeki where it jumped the shark so hard that I just dropped it all together. Uh, I don't care how that thing ends. At this it point. kept jumping the shark after. Yeah, that, that's, way, that's so. what I've heard. Yeah. They did kept jumping there, but Brad, very interesting question. Thank you. Then Riv, who is also in our feedback section, but he gets a, gets a question here too. How does it currently get determined which anime gets simultast on Crunchyroll and which go to Funimation or other services for that matter? Uh, with the French crunchy, crunchy, funny question may soon become moot, but are there bidding wars for various titles? Do production companies have deals, contracts with one or the other? Yes, yes, yes. There are bidding wars for some titles. Some are sweetheart deals between production committees and, and, and particular licensors that they have a good longstanding relationship with. Sometimes we even have licensors on the production committees of certain shows, although they're usually very low ranking on those shows. But if they're on the production committee, obviously it's a given that they're going to be the uh, they're they're going to simulcast it. And then, as you may have noticed, Riv, that there are some shows that actually appear on both Crunchyroll and Funimation. So it's really a little bit of a grab bag of all of the above of your question, uh, bits and pieces. But it very rarely is it a case of, you know, a production committee will put a show out there and all the licensors will get up and, and bid, you know, huge sums of money for the right to simulcast it. It does, doesn't generally work that way. We're not talking about huge sums of money to begin with. But yeah, it, so sometimes it's sometimes there is a bidding situation. A lot of time there is a prearrangement of some sort, either a formal production committee involvement or just a, a just a long standing a, a long standing relationship between the production committee members and a particular licensor, and sometimes it shows up on both. So that's my yes. answer. Any any thoughts on this? Yes, I think the one thing that you mentioned relationships, business relationships in Japan made, matter a lot, and business gets very personal. Uh, and the one tidbit I have on this is I remember when Netflix got Evangelion, the president of Funimation at the time was livid and openly was complaining about the fact that Netflix kind of swooped in and got that one. And, you know, it was kind of very uncharacteristic and kind of unprofessional of him to do it, but it affected him that much. So mm. this kind of stuff, it gets very personal and it's been very cutthroat. And obviously Netflix has been 
undercutting them probably because of the money thing, the better scheduling, all that stuff. Uh, not undercutting them. They've been they've been winning a lot of the the big gets and stuff like that. And I think um, Crunchyroll and I think uh, Funimation have been able to, with those relationships and they're tied to the production committee system, have been able to kind of get some stuff as well. But the big gets have been with Netflix and even Amazon for a time. So I, I think the business relationship and the money are the two big things. Yeah, and I, the point with Netflix for me is that they have so much money that they can they can sort of pass go and not collect two hundred dollars kind of thing because they can bypass what you described the the relationship the business relationship thing is hugely important in Japan and these things take years to build and cultivate and Netflix can come along and just throw a, such a huge pile of money on the table that they can they can jump the queue and that's a lot of what's been happening and I think that's there are some ruffled feathers like you described with uh, Evangelion. There are some ruffled feathers with this because that's just not how business is usually done in Japan. But Netflix doesn't have to do business the way it's usually done in Japan. They're rich enough that they can do things the way they want. And that's why Netflix is such a huge randomizing element for the future of anime because they are so much bigger than anybody else in the international market that they can completely change the business model just by their presence. Screw the rules. I have money. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily sure for anime that that's a bad thing in this case, but that's a long, again, detailed conversation, some of which we've already had. Uh, so that's, but yes, interesting question, Rib. Thank you very much for that. And with that, I believe we have come to the end of another Notaku anime chat. It's been a great pleasure as always. And we want to, of course, talk about anime, yeah, anime-evo.net lostinanime.com or as it's sometimes called lost in america we're all over the twitter at Setsuken, at guardian enzo at notaku chat notaku pod notaku pod our <laughs> we never get that right and our uh, email address is notaku at anime-evo.net and uh, we love you we appreciate you please be with us as we continue to evolve and grow as our solar system expands notaku forever and uh, any last thoughts for our listeners Setsuken? Yeah, I don't think uh, people will have too much to complain because we still gave them a mid-sized boy here this week. Mm. Yes, maybe not a Yokozuna, but definitely a sumo. Uh, Okay, thank you, everybody. As always, thank you for listening. It's been great, and stay frosty. Bye-bye.